Dogman seems to be rather popular these days. It seems like there are many sightings going across the country, and even internationally. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today I'm going to be sharing some creepy and downright strange Dogman stories that'll freak you out tonight. Joining me is my good friend Zach Baby TV. If you enjoy his voice, be sure to check out his channel. There's a link to do so in the description. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Before we jump right into these Dogman Encounters Swamp Folk, today's episode is sponsored by ShipStation. Now, you guys have been buying so many Swamp Dweller t-shirts and hoodies that I've been spending more time at the post office than I have at my own swamp. So, ShipStation has been nothing but amazing for me. Online shopping isn't slowing down anytime soon. So your business needs to be ready to keep up the pace. With ShipStation, you'll never worry about shipping again. Make the switch to a solution that handles all of your shipping needs quickly, affordably, and painlessly. Personally, my favorite part of ShipStation is not only the ease of use and the money that I save, but that everything is just about automated when it comes to shipping. It only takes a few clicks to ship something out. You can save your sanity knowing all of your orders are handled and you're getting the best rates possible. It makes shipping easy so you can focus on the things that matter most when it comes to your business. So what are you waiting for? Join me and many others in the swamp who are shipping more in less time with ShipStation. Use my offer code SWAMPED to get a 60-day free trial. That's two months free of no-hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the page, and type in SWAMPED. That's S-W-A-M-P-E-D. ShipStation. Make ship happen. Hello there, Swamp Dweller. You can call me Mr. B. I have heard the majority of your stories told on the channel. I want to say I love your narrations. Now then, I wanted to tell you of a time I came face to face what I could only describe to be as a dog man. For context, I'm a 26-year-old male, 5'6", and kind of buff. Never scared easy, coming to think of it, standing face to face with this thing, I got a otherworldly presence. Anyways, I'm getting out of mind here. As I was saying, this all took place at my good friend Jason's house in Mount Poconos. Now, Jay's place was not too shabby. It wasn't exactly what you would think of for a home up there. It was very modern. Jason loved to drink. So, as we would do every other weekend, we would get smashed and have a good time. Okay, now for the story. I was gearing up to go out ice fishing with Jason late at night, drinking and having some fun doing nothing but staying warm with these pocket warmers. So it wasn't all bad. I arrived at Jay's place a little after five as we would be drinking shots before we went, but something deep down was telling me not to drink so much that night. I don't know if it was a weird feeling you get when your body can sense something isn't right while you physically can't. So I chose the latter and kind of drank here and there. Jason asked why I wasn't drinking as much, but I said not to sour the mood. Sorry, man. Just got terrible pains in my stomach. Jason replies, well, alcohol heals all. I laughed and said, nah, man, I gotta go to the bathroom. He said, forget you then. Obviously starting to get drunk already. So I head to the bathroom. I feel this overwhelming sense that something just isn't right. For further background... I have a family of occult witchcraft. I was blessed by my grandmother's sister right before she passed. This haunts me to think about, but I'm living strong. As I am standing there, this window looks out into the forest, and a dense forest surrounds it. I take a look, and in the distance, I see what can only be described as glowing blood-red eyes. I take a step back and leave the bathroom immediately. I get to my friend who was already ready to go, and I saw that he was drunk as a skunk. Having a backpack of 12 cans of bush, his bottle of vodka, you can say he was definitely a bit tipsy. 
He looked at me and said, Hey, you ready, or will you be a sissy and chicken out? I gave him this look like, don't go. But I said, no man, I'm good. I'll come with. He's my friend. I won't abandon him there if something is lurking about. So I gear up, but I take a simple sod off that he keeps under his kitchen sink with some slugs. I take them and load them up. Jay asked, Hey man, what are you doing with my baby? I said, Well, I thought it would be fun to shoot some cans when we're done. He of course goes, Oh yeah man, let's do it. I dump half the shells in my bag and get up and head out. It was a crisp, cold night. We headed out to find some ponds. Yeah, sounds dumb, I know, but this is my friend. He was there for me when nobody else was like a brother. I also brought spray paint with me, pure white to mark our paths so we wouldn't be lost. Now then, we are going deep into the woods, and it is so dead quiet that you could hear the drop of a waterfall from a mile away. It wasn't right. It was off. I couldn't help shaking it off. We are being watched by a dark, solid force. There was a presence. I looked around as my friend slowly stumbles and falls. I go to him, pick him up, and say, I think we should head back. You're too drunk. Let's party in the house, man. He looks up, smiles drunkenly, and says, Sure, I want to listen to ACDC. It's too cold. Besides, we're probably out of beer as well, he says in his drunken state. So I slowly picked him up, and we started walking back very slowly. We turn around, and I see it there, standing behind us not even 50 feet away. This thing was tall. If I had to guess, it was roughly 10 feet tall or maybe even bigger. This creature was just standing there before me and my friend. Sounds began to emanate from this thing just breathing and the steam coming from its nose with those same blood red eyes I saw before. It didn't do anything but stare at me, but I knew that this thing was much more hostile if it wanted to be. I was trying to understand what, what it wanted and it seemed like it was trying to understand what we wanted. Or maybe it was deciding to attack us, or if it was going to let us go. Now I know that not many would take this as accurate and brush it off as a rubbish dogman encounter story. But to me, being from my family, it was more than understanding that we were not so different. I had my curse and it had its curse to bear. Mine is to be doomed to loneliness, as my friend Jason died six months after this. To end this story, the beast then closed its eyes, and just like that, it was gone in the darkness of the trees. We scrambled and made it back to safety. My friend literally peed himself, and I didn't know what to say or believe what we had seen that night. This again was six months before his death. In the end, as I say, my curse is loneliness. Well, that is true. I have no friends, but I work. Not much family left, that's for sure. And it isn't enjoyable nowadays about having anyone be your friend, as I am also an empath. Honestly, this was a life-changing encounter with what I can only describe as Dogman, and I would love to know what others would think about this. And thank you, Swamp Dweller, for sharing my story. Okay. What the heck is that shrieking sound? My girlfriend was only mildly frustrated from the background noise. I looked at her with a concerned look, as there was not much that I could do to stop the frightful wailing coming from the backyard. Sorry, my love, I told her through the phone, glancing up to my bedroom window across the room. It's the neighbor's dog. There must be a rabbit or something in the yard. I'm sure it's nothing. Well, it's kind of annoying me. All I could hear is that static shrieking through the phone. It's driving me crazy. Now forgive me if I make it sound like my girlfriend in any way dislikes dogs. That is not the case. She absolutely adores all animals, especially dogs. My neighbor's pet was simply growling in such a feral way that it could hardly be called a dog's bark. It sounded more akin to a wild animal fighting tooth and nails to save its life. The first night that I heard the howling outside my bedroom window, I was originally assuming that it was a wild coyote that had gotten hold of the neighbor's pet. However, the sounds did not cease as they should have. Hours have passed further into the night, 
and the dog continued to wail. This continued every night for nearly a week. The timing in which the animal would begin its horrendous screaming was not consistent, nor was the duration in which said screaming had lasted. I had contemplated speaking to the neighbor's son about their pet dog, but, due to my poor social skills, I had decided against it. Maybe I'll talk to my dad or one of the neighbors about it tomorrow morning and try to get some answers, I thought out loud. You should, because I don't want to hear it every night we call, she stated with such a tone in her voice that I got an impression the whole situation was my fault. Whether or not she intended to make me feel that way, she would never tell me. However, it was likely that she was not impressed with me ignoring the barking as a whole, rather than simply speaking with the neighbors about the animal's noise. The next morning, over an unhealthy breakfast of pancakes drowned in maple syrup, I had asked my father if he had heard the barking through the recent events. He confirmed that he had indeed heard the noise, and he had planned on asking the neighbors to keep their pets inside through the nights. It was clear to me that he had not slept as well as he had in the nights before. My father's eyes were sunken slightly, and barely visible dark circles had formed around them. His face seemed longer and more susceptible to frowning than his normal cheery look, and it was likely due to the fact that his eyes were so tired looking. That dang dog, he muttered before finishing his coffee and placing his mug into the sink. My father worked long days as a factory manager. He often had spent his spare time in the building itself to ensure the success of his employees, and more importantly, the future of his job. He had left that morning around 8 and likely wouldn't be home until 8 or so shortly after that night. His sleep schedule through the nights, where the dog's screeching was more apparent, was nearly non-existent. He had tasked me with the house chores through the days while he was away. One such chore was to visit the neighbor and, yes you guessed it, politely ask for them to keep their pets inside, or at the very least keep them quiet through the night as he was unsure when he would be able to ask in person. I bid him farewell on his day, and finished all the other household chores I had been tasked with for the day before noon hour. After baking some homemade sweets and preparing dinner, I had thrown together a dessert package for the neighbors, hoping that this would lessen the blow of my complaint. I rehearsed what I had prepared to say while I walked down the driveway to the five-minute dirt road to my neighbor's residence. The Whitmers were always kind people, from when I had remembered them. Mrs. Whitmer had passed away, too young as my father would say. Much like my mother, Mrs. Whitmer had left to go for a morning jog and had disappeared not five minutes from her own home. The difference between the two was that her body was found near the edge of a dense forest by authorities nearly four days later and less than a half a mile from her own front door. The official cause of death was a bear attack, as the body was so horribly mangled and torn apart. Those five and a half long years without his wife had mentally destroyed Mr. Whitmer. He had become a hollow, cranky old shell of a former man he was. Mr. and Mrs. Whitmer had always loved to be outside with their vast array of pets, but in the years following Mrs. Whitmer's death, Mr. Whitmer was very rarely seen outside. The one memory that stuck with me about Mrs. Whitmer was the one of her telling me various tales of her husband's sweet tooth as she baked me cookies in the evening that my father had led the search party for my mother on the day that she went missing. She had passed away a year after my mother nearly to the day. I knocked on Mr. Whitmer's door, slightly praying that the tray of sweets at the very least would be enough to brighten his mood. After nearly two minutes, I had reached my hand out to knock again, but jumped back when I heard the lock violently turn and the door was pulled open. Hmm, what's this? He asked with a clear expression of confusion on his face. The old man was considerably more frail than the last time I had seen him, his face riddled with wrinkles, his hair thin and gray. He was slouching towards the open door with his arm holding the door open in such a manner 
that it appeared that he was using the door to hold himself up. I was afraid he would fall over at any moment. Uh, hi. Hello, uh, Mr. Whitmer. I stuttered out while trying desperately to remember the speech I had planned out. I was doing some baking for my dad and, uh, thought you might want a tray of some homemade sweets and stuff. I awkwardly smiled while holding the tray out for him to take. A warm smile slowly crossed his face as he held up one hand to decline my offer. No, no, it's quite thoughtful, son, but I haven't been able to eat anything like that in years. My sugar's too high, see? He explained. Oh, I, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Whitmer. I didn't realize. I stammered feeling my own embarrassment becoming clear on my face. But before I could say anything else, Mr. Whitmer gazed out his front door and towards my house. Your new pup must be driving your father bonkers. He's awfully loud, ain't he? Huh? Oh, we don't have a new pup, Mr. Whitmer. I felt chills run down my spine. The gravity of the situation hadn't fully sunken in yet, but it was startling nonetheless. That's why I came. I thought that maybe, maybe it was your dog. I trailed off. He slowly adjusted his gaze to me. I think in that moment, both the old man and I realized the same thing. I apologized to my neighbor for interrupting his day, to which he dismissed and welcomed me over any time. Before you go, he started as I had half turned away from his front door. You best stay inside after dark. Don't let your paw out if you can't help it, son. His face was pale, filled with fear, though he had obviously been trying to hide it. Clearly, this man had known more than he was willing to let on. I nodded and began towards my house. That evening was not unlike most evenings for me. I made and ate my dinner alone, prepared a plate for my father's late return, and hand-washed the dishes that I had dirtied. I then made myself comfortable on the living room couch after popping in an old shark movie from the 70s in the DVD player. I wanted to be close to the front door to greet my father upon his return, hence why I chose to reside temporarily within the closest room to the front entrance, the living room. After a particular scene where the antagonist shark of the film jump-scared an old fishing boat, my father had unlocked the front door loudly. The creaky metal lock snapped open lined up nearly perfectly with the jump scare that I nearly fell off the couch, due to the startling sound my father made. My father entered the house, closing the door behind him as I regained my composure. I must have done a poor job of hiding my temporary fright as he asked me if I was alright as soon as he saw me. I then explained the scare that he gave me, to which we had a laugh together. He then took off his shoes, warmed his dinner, and joined me for the film's final. Having seen the movie so often, my father had quoted nearly every memorable line left in the film, and we remarked on the film's greatness as the credits began to roll. My father had began to feast while I searched through our old films for another classic to play. I looked back to my father as soon as I heard the faint squealing sounds coming from outside. He sat a few feet behind me in his lazy boy armchair, chewing slow and quietly as he listened. Mr. Whitmer, I started, but my father only nodded as he finished chewing and finished my sentence for me. He doesn't have a dog. I dropped by his place on my way home. I waited. I waited for my father to continue. I waited for my father to express how proud he was of me for making our neighbor's sweets. I waited for my father to change the topic. I waited for my father to express his theories as to which he believed the barking to be. Finally, he spoke. I don't want you going outside for a while. Not if you could help it. I'm going to take some time off and we're going to take a vacation soon. I looked to him with concern. 
He was raising more questions than he was answering, and I knew that if I was to pray, then he would only become stressed. My father rarely stresses, but when he does, he typically would not calm down for a few hours. I would not want him to lose any extra sleep over stress, as he was only getting a bare minimum amount of sleep anyways. My father and I indulged in my homemade sweets while trying to ignore the screaming animal outside. I had prayed that the sounds would eventually fade into background noise, but I could never get used to the wailing no matter how hard I tried. My father had ended up going up to bed shortly after 10 o'clock that evening. I had decided to text my girlfriend while I finished watching an 80s science fiction robot movie to try to distract myself from the blood-curdling howling coming from the backyard. I did not want to tell my girlfriend about how the screeching had not stopped since our last phone call, due to the lack of answers I possessed as to what was creating the screeching. I was concerned that she would grow to worry for me. Ever figure out why your neighbor's dog keeps barking every night? Beside her text was a little yellow ponder emoji. You know, the one with the little index finger and the thumb stroking the chin of the circular head? That's the one. No, not yet. It's probably just some wild animal scaring it. Or maybe it's the mating call of a fox or a coyote. I messaged her back and used the same thinking emoji that she had sent me. Now feeling stressed about the mysterious and ever so consistent animal howling outside, I decided that I would partake in eating some potato chips to cure my anxious thoughts. I may have developed a bad habit of stress eating junk food the night my mother went missing. Now I am by no means obese, I am quite thin and I rarely eat such foods to begin with. However, when I do, I eat a lot at once. I stood up off the couch and paused the film with the television remote. With the soundtrack of the movie now on pause, it was at this point that I had suddenly realized that terror sounds from outside were no longer present. In fact, nearly every sound was gone. It was so quiet that I was positive that I could hear the blood rushing from my ears. I heard my heart racing, throbbing in my chest. My slow and shallow breaths came out like blaring bomb sirens when compared to the stillness in that moment. I think it stopped. I text my girlfriend after a long moment of standing still. I took one step towards the kitchen and froze when I heard a loud crashing sound coming from the basement. I jumped as I heard what sounded like several glass pans smashing to millions of pieces on the downstairs floor. My father had likely heard the loud crash too, as he was out of his room and down the stairway leading to the second floor in a matter of seconds his double-barrel shotgun held firmly in hand. His knuckles were white as he clutched the gun and, with a satisfying click, he opened the gun and popped two ammunition shells into the barrel and popped the shotgun closed. I stood motionless, frozen, staring deep into my father's eyes. I was searching for comfort, for anything that would calm me down, anything to tell me that we would be okay and safe. I never found what I was looking for. What the hell was that? My father whispered under his breath as he stared behind me towards the basement door. He kept his eyes trained on that door and never once took his eyes off of it. He kept his ears alert and listened for any further sounds, and he kept his shotgun loaded and firmly in his grasp. I didn't reply to him, I simply stood still. After another minute or two of us locked in the situation, tied like puppets by the strings of fear, my father slowly loosened his grip on the gun and brought it down to his side in one hand. Must just be a squirrel or... Just as quickly as my father had started speaking, he was cut off by the horrible wailing again. The wailing was much louder now. The sound was not coming from outside. This time, the sound was coming from the basement, right below us. The window pans on the front door began to rattle, 
and the pictures were violently shaken off the walls. I dropped my phone and brought up my hands to cover my ears. I clenched my teeth and shut my eyes, but no matter how hard I tried, I was unable to prevent the sounds from reaching my ears. My palms grew sweaty and wet. No, not sweat. It was blood. My ears bled and rang. My head pounded. My vision blurred. The whole world began to rapidly spin around me. At some point, my father had grabbed my arm and led me outside in a panic. He led me directly to the deep blue pickup truck that he drove and I climbed into the passenger seat while he went around to the driver's side and pulled himself inside. He gently tossed the shotgun to the back seat and gripped the steering wheel. After a moment of us both catching our breaths, he looked to me and analyzed my wounds. He too had a small trickle of blood coming from his ears. Are you hurt? He asked me breathlessly. No, I'm fine, I stammered out. Wh what was that thing? I asked. Well, I sure could tell you it ain't no bear, he started while he looked around for his keys. After a long moment, and his single deep inhale followed by him blowing out all of his air from his lungs aggressively through his mouth, he stated, They're inside as calmly as he could. I knew what he meant. We were trapped until one of us had decided to leave the temporary safety of the vehicle and head into the monster's new lair to retrieve our salvation. I'm faster than you are, I began. No, he said calmly, yet firmly. I can fire the gun you've shown me before. I said no, my father yelled his emotions taking control over him. I've lost your mother to that thing, and I ain't losing you to it. It was apparent that he had instinctively regretted saying what he had just said, as he was likely trying to hide this from me for some time. I wondered if Mr. Whitmer had known about this creature as well. I waited a long while before I asked what had been on my mind. Lost mom to what, Dad? He was silently sobbing for what felt like an eternity before he wiped his eyes and looked over at me. The night that we lost her, he began slowly, seemingly second-guessing on whether or not he should tell me. I led that search party through the woods, and eventually the sun began to set. We were going to pack it in for the night and look again come morning. However, there was a shriek, a small whimper, a cry of some sort, off in the distance. So a few of us go, flashlights drawn, and we take a look. Well, we turned from a few trees and we got to where it came from, but there ain't nothing there. We looked around and around, but still nothing. Then, one of the guys gets the bright idea to look up. I tell you, son, I prayed more in those five minutes than I ever have in my whole life. He paused for about a minute, his gaze fixed to the front door of the house, still wide open with the living room's orange lights spilling just outside the front door. The wailing had stopped again, which to me was not any more relief than if it had kept going. He stroked his scruffy chin before continuing. Up in that tree, there was something big. It looked to be like some really muscular badger or maybe a wolverine or some sort of dog. But the thing that glowed from the flashlight's beam was your mother's favorite necklace. It was just there, dangling outside of its mouth. The thing was staring at us with its lifeless eyes, just pure black eyes. It let out its cry, the same way we've been hearing. Just a single yelp and it hopped off through the trees. That one was the baby, cause something real big, much bigger than it, was following. We ran like hell out of there. We never found that thing again. We went looking the next day. Didn't even find the necklace. If my father had told me this tale any other night, 
I would have thought that he was drunk the night he went searching for my mother all those years ago. However, given the current situation, I believed him. Of course, the police didn't believe us. They thought that we had encountered a raccoon in the trees or something else small, I suppose. As I gawked at my father, something caught my eye. Right outside his driver's side window were two small yellow circles simply hovering. I shifted my gaze and peered out his window as he kept talking. I didn't pick up on what he was saying. I only focused on the figure outside his window. I realized too late that the yellow orbs were actually the moon's reflection on the shiny black eyes of this creature. The bean smashed its head through the window with ease, its massive hulking canine-like head over my father's lap and in front of his face. Both my father and I jumped from terror. The creature began violently shaking its massive head back and forth, opening and closing its maw. Its teeth were a deep yellow and looked more like shark's teeth. They were thick, triangular, and serrated, and the beast had countless rows of these teeth in its snout. Its fur was thick, jet black with matted patches of red. Blood formed around the top and bottom of the creature's head, from where it had cut itself on the broken glass, yet it seemed to be in no pain as it continued to shake its fierce head snarling and biting the air. Its eyes looked fake. They were bulging orbs of shiny blackness, almost like that of a stuffed teddy bear's eyes. Between my screaming and my father kicking and pounding on the beast's head, he yelled for me to fire the shotgun into the creature's face. I spun around and tried to reach for the gun in the back seat, my fingertips managed to graze the gun's handle as a wet, warm splash of liquid drenched over my face, accompanied by a sickening, wet, squishy sound. My father screamed, and I wiped my eyes and spat out the copper-tasting fluid. With an extremely deep crunching, more of my father's pain hollering and the blood flying everywhere, the beast had pulled my father out the truck door window by his left arm and off into the night. Within seconds, I was alone, shaking in shock and in silence. I sobbed before slowly turning around and again reaching for the shotgun. I had not entirely processed what had just happened in those short few minutes as, when I retrieved the firearm, I aimed it out the window that the monster had dragged my father out of and whimpered about how I didn't want to shoot my dad and how the beast was moving too much to get a good shot. A series of quiet and fast knocking on my window jolted me back into reality. As I spun around, not sure of what to expect, Mr. Whitmer stood outside my door, face full of confusion. Sonny, are you alright? Where's your pa? He asked in his tired voice. I only screamed something about a dire wolf going rogue, which, of course, had confused him even more so. Through my panic attempts to warn the old man, he had eventually understood the important part of the message and turned to go back towards his house. The poor old man hadn't made it three feet from my window before the canine creature had appeared seemingly out of nowhere and proceeded to maul the man. He didn't even scream while the attack happened, either because the attack startled him so badly that his heart gave out or because the animal had attacked his head and neck area to begin with, and had killed him instantly. It viciously tore at the man and shook him around as his corpse was a new chewing toy for the oversized dog. An arm had flown off and cracked my window before leaving a thick streak of blood from the large crack towards the ground. I nearly threw up when I saw the cryptid holding the body in its mouth. Then it stood on its hind legs, placing its front paws on the torso of the old man's body and separated the body in half from its waist. I closed my eyes and listened to the horrible sound of the man being reduced to ribbons only a few feet away from me. The sound of police sirens and the multicolored flashing lights had began enough to persuade the creature into hiding. I watched as it growled its deep growl 
and turned a full 180 degrees and sprinted into the dense forest behind my house. I sat there and sobbed, waiting for the officers to collect me. By the time a kind ambulance driver and young police officer had arrived at the truck door, I was dry heaving and on the verge of hyperventilating. There was no physical trauma done to me, so I sat in the back of the ambulance with one of the younger officers and a blanket wrapped around me. She explained to me that there was a call from the neighbor's house, as the man who had placed the call was worried from all the commotion outside. God bless you, Mr. Whitmore, I thought to myself. I then explained to the young woman how the dog-like creature had used its screaming to try and deafen my father and I, about how the animal had broken into the house, and about how it dragged my father away, and lastly about the death of Mr. Whitmore. The remains of Mr. Whitmore had only been several long strips of flesh, and clothes in a small puddle of blood with the odd bone fragment. His whole right arm was later recovered just under my father's pickup truck on the passenger side, while other officers drew their weapons and examined the surrounding area. I kept insisting to the woman that it was a dog that lived in the trees with rows and rows of teeth, with a horrible scream with its lifeless coal black eyes. They recorded the entire incident as a bear attack, of course, and dismissed my story as shock-induced trauma. They found my father, still breathing however unconscious, in the backyard, near the tree line. His whole left arm from about the shoulder down was severely shredded. He and I were rushed to the hospital in the ambulance, and he underwent immediate surgery on his arm. They could only do as much in terms of nerve repair. However, he was able to keep his arm. He would go through several long months of therapy to regain nearly complete control over his arm and all his fingers. He cannot extend any finger in full length, nor can he touch the palm of his hand with his fingertips. However, he has gotten used to using his hand quite well. He is still considerably weaker in that arm than in the other, though he was always more dominant in his right arm anyways. As for me, I have received extensive therapy for my daily nightmares. I've had the odd case of that creature returning to me in a state of sleep paralysis, which is a horror story on its own. The truly haunting part is that I haven't heard a single sound since the last attack a year ago. The haunting part is knowing that this creature is out there and still alive. The haunting part is finding out that these creatures go into hiding for about 50 weeks or so out of the year and then they come out for two. The haunting part is hearing the screaming coming from the forest last night accompanied by another, much louder screaming. A much closer screaming. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property in 11 acres of woods in a rural part of the northeastern Minnesota area. The woods were connected to a more significant acreage of fields and woods of about 160 acres, and although sparsely populated, the land is near a fairly busy state highway. There are some housing developments in the area, but they are about 3-4 to four miles away and the majority of the land all around our property is farm, fields, woods, and rivers. It's incredibly remote, but I wouldn't call it wild with towns so close. I'm mentioning this because I've heard of many Native American legends of things in the deep northern woods of Minnesota and Canada, but the area we live in is not that. Rural, yes, but not the endless north woods. As I said earlier, I'm not a believer in the supernatural and I've never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors. Even though I have a healthy sense of caution and respect for giant bears, moose, wolves, or other potentially dangerous wildlife, I am also an avid hunter and mountaineer and have experienced many nights in the wilderness. I've had numerous encounters with dangerous animals or situations, so I'm not entirely spooked too easily. Knowing my state of mind is essential to my story because... 
People can explain so-called supernatural encounters with an already high level of belief, anxiety, or fear, but that's not me. Well, that all changed after the first few weeks of moving in. The house and land had been abandoned for a couple of years due to foreclosure. So much work was needed to be done to get it back into shape. Wildlife had grown accustomed to no human presence, and black bears frequently roamed the yard at night, and many other woodland creatures also found this to be some sort of highway. We also found many animal bones scattered throughout the woods and an abundance of coyotes. One night during those first few weeks, we had a rainstorm, and I was worried about a broken downspout potentially causing a basement lake. It was about 10 p.m., so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with it. Behind our house is a relatively large, swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspout when suddenly, I had this intense feeling of dread. It's tough to explain the surface, but my body knew something was back there. It wasn't a normal feeling of observation. I had never felt this type of fear before. I tried to stay calm and slowly turned around to point my headlamp back towards the swamp. What I saw was something I still can't explain. Eyes. Numerous glowing reflecting eyes are staring back at me. These were not the eye reflections of what you would see with deer or other animal, since they were different heights. And when I pointed my headlamp right where you would expect these things to be, there would be nothing but weeds and trees. When I turned the headlamp off, they were still there and glowing as if they were right there with a light being shined on them. They did not move. They just stared through me. I bolted and ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as a deer or some sort of raccoon. Later that summer, I sat on our screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected the woods to the east. It was approximately 11 p.m., and when I heard what sounds like a bear fighting or some sort of thing attacking a cow, since there was a small farm to the southwest of my property, I assumed that perhaps a cow wandered off into the woods and was being attacked by a bear. I didn't know if this was something that a bear would do, but it was my only guess based on the sounds I was hearing at the time. It was some sort of roar like a bear, but then followed by a frantic sounding cow's mooing. This went on for over an hour, and it was perhaps one of the most horrifying sounds I've ever heard. It did not frighten me since I had this rational explanation, but even weirder, this same series of sounds happened again over the following summer. I never investigated the area of the woods these sounds came from because it was not my property. A couple of years later, I had the chance to purchase this area and 70 acres to the west, which consisted of the woods connected to mine and a few tilled fields and more lumber and ponds. As part of purchasing this land, I spent a lot of time walking around it to understand its value and layout. As part of my walk, I was able to get a much better look at the farm set up to the south. As I suspected, the farm did have cows, but the area they were kept in was a long distance away from my house much too far for me to be able to hear them. The fencing was also exceptionally well built and electrified. There was no way a cow would just wander out from that farm. I didn't think about this until recently, but it's best to lay everything out in chronological order. After obtaining the property, I put up tree stands at various locations and trail cameras to prep for the upcoming deer hunting season. One spot was the hilly woods where I heard those sounds many years prior. Again, I did not connect these two things until now. The area was very odd, as whenever I hiked through there, I always saw some new strange thing. One time, my son and I found an old game snare tied to a tree that looked like it had been dried with blood. Another time, we saw at least a hundred-year-old tree with a barbed wire fence completely spiraling the entire trunk, growing in and out of the different intervals. I've also found many tree trunks with substantial scratches or claw marks not resembling an antler rub or any sort of bear, but maybe it's just a giant bear, who knows. We'd almost always find dead animal bones in this area, and even this winter I found a couple of deer legs snapped and picked clean. My sons have found numerous animal skulls out there as well. As I was saying, I put a game camera in this area since I had seen tracks and signs and wanted to get a sense of the best place to hunt. I've tried one there many seasons, and unlike my other cameras, I've never captured anything on it. Nothing. Not a single thing. 
My son has posted there a couple of times for hunting season as mentioned a strange sense of quiet. He used to think the forest sounds were just lacking in this area. Maybe there weren't many bugs or something. But he would note that they would sometimes come alive again randomly and be just as loud as everywhere else. As if something were coming and going. He has mentioned hearing something walking around in the past as well. A couple of years ago, my son went out hiking in the woods to try to find me since I was out doing some forest management. As he walked through this area, he thought he spotted me coming through the woods fast, but quickly noticed that the walk and clothing were nothing like mine. He said this quote-unquote person he saw did not notice him and seemed to be walking in a straight line, like they had tunnel vision or something. Seeing someone in this part of the woods in their travel direction doesn't make any sense since there would be no reason for them to even be doing this, especially since the way they were going only leads to deep ravines in an uncrossable river. After he found me and explained what he saw, I quickly investigated whether he was a trespasser or if it was something else. I hiked for quite a while, but I never found anything or anyone. They either got picked up on the road or vanished. That same year, my son had a friend over, and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field next to the area of woods. They saw a figure a little ways off in the trees as they passed by. Whatever they saw was near one of the hills in this patch of forest and seemed to be making some hand gestures. It began strolling towards them. When they called out, Hey, hello? He, or it, stopped and said nothing. At this point, the boys sensed something was wrong, and they bolted back toward the house. They rushed into the house and told me what they saw, and I of course laughed it off as their minds playing tricks on them. My son described the figure as being very tall, like 10 to 15 feet, but with skinny arms. Its body was dark with hair all over. They even thought it was an animal because of its odd appearance. It even seemingly had German Shepherd type ears. It was gaunt and skinny and strangely, strangely long. Being the curious and protective father I am, I was worried about it being a trespasser, a drug addict, or something even worse. So I told them I would take a look. They brought me to the area and pointed to where it was standing, and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter and there was snow on the ground, I thought it would be easy to locate the tracks of whatever this thing was and find out where it came from and where it went to. There wasn't a single track or disturbance in the snow when I got to that spot though. There was no way an animal or a man could have been in that area and left no traces. They had either made it up or their minds really had played tricks on them. Or so I thought. My son and his friends still swear they saw it, clear as day and I can attest that their fright was real. My wife has also experienced strange thrashing sounds and other feelings of dread or being watched in this part of the woods and generally refuses to go there anymore. All of this brings me to today, where I suddenly realized that all of these strange sounds, sightings, bones, and events seem to be centered around this one area, and I'm just at a complete loss of what it all means. It's all too strange to bring this up and discuss it with people I know around here, but I wanted to see if my story would resonate with anyone here in the swamp. I'll continue to investigate on my end, but I would love to know what you all think. After doing some internet research, it does sound very similar to a dog man, but there are also some strange circumstances that don't quite match up. Growing up, I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by, and we were like two peas in a pod. We were both very adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. I got introduced to fishing with my friend's family, and did a lot of camping with them. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were about 10 to 12 years old at the time. It's been a while, so I can't remember exactly. On one camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest surrounded by a meadow, and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. Anyway, we played in the field and stream all day while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't too big, because it had a huge meadow all around it. He could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished, 
While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me a weird vibe. I couldn't explain it. I just felt uneasy. Anyway, the day faded into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad packed up his fishing gear and we walked back to the truck on this long, winding path through the woods. Once in the car, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way to the steep road that was so rough and inclined that I was convinced that my friend's dad would break his truck. He had a four, maybe six-cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. I'm not even sure if the truck had four-wheel drive, but I trusted him because he was an avid Alaskan outdoorsman with years of experience. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open with a significant forest area in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up, and my friend and I decided to explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards away from the tents when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in the direction but did not see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we walked more, we heard it again and whispered about what it could be, but we kept on going. It stopped briefly, and when we were about 200 yards from camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep, wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we had come. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations were going wild. We came up with everything from a serial killer stalking us in the woods to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that her dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with that all night. My friend and I were sharing one tent, and he was in his tent not far from us, so we figured everything should be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night, I'm not sure what time it was, to hear something or someone walking outside. I could listen to it quietly circling the tent as I lay there listening. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had a distinct rhythm to how it walked. That said, it sounded big. It sounded like it had clear weight to it, if that makes any sense. As it put each foot down and walked, I could even hear relatively quiet but deep heavy breathing at times. As I listened intently, I could hear it wandering to other parts of the campsite, then back to our tent, almost as if it were walking in a big repetitive loop. For who knows how long, it felt like an eternity to me. Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I listened until I eventually fell asleep. The following day, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I don't think they believed me. Interestingly enough, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft and covered in grass in some places, so footprints weren't very legible, but there were some clear, giant, wolf-looking prints. I always wondered what walked around our tent that night. After hearing many stories from the swamp dweller, I think it might have been some sort of dog man. Let me start this by saying this is based off an encounter with a specific cryptid I heard growing up. This did happen in Mammoth Cave National Park, if you believe in cryptids that is. I'll leave that up to you all to decide. Names and dates have been changed to protect the identity of the individual along with the ending. They are happy and healthy to this very day. I hope you all enjoy. Stay Out of Mammoth Cave National Park by Trevor Murray I have always loved the woods. Ever since I was a small child, I have found more comfort in them than anywhere else. It wasn't until my adult life that this changed. It all started on a normal camping trip during a cold November weekend. Most people would have canceled the trip due to it recently raining and with a high of 37 all weekend long, however, I enjoy the extra challenge. The trip was to Mammoth Cave National Park in South Central Kentucky. For those of you who aren't in the know, Mammoth Cave is the largest cave system in the world, with a beautiful national park full of amazing trails and places to go canoeing 
and all your other favorite outdoor activities. This is of course on the surface level. Many locals know not to go on the north side of the park at night alone, or even in a small group. Quite a few people have gone missing over the years, and very seldom is it on the south side of the park. The park is split down the middle by the Green River which stretches across the park from east to west, which connects Nolan Lake and Green River Lake, both of which being popular spots during the summer for camping. Everyone's uncle had seen Bigfoot in these woods. Heck, I'm sure they all had shared a sandwich a time or two. I've never believed in the paranormal. I think it all can be explained away with logic and reasoning. Saw a ghost? Yeah, right. That's just your brain imagining it. Did that light just turn off on its own? Sure. You might want to call the electrician to fix the crappy job the first electrician did while the house was being built. In saying that, I will admit that I did enjoy a good story, especially creepy ones found across the internet, especially those of the local urban legend across Kentucky of the Goatman or the Barilla. For those who don't know what the Barilla is, it is a local legend in South Central Kentucky about an animal frequently seen at Native American burial grounds and local cemeteries at the edge of small towns. It's described to have short black gray fur with a massive waist and even larger arms. It didn't get the name Barilla for nothing. Its head is being described as one of a large wolf with long pointy ears, amber eyes, and short stubby snout. Some have described it more along the lines of what a stereotypical werewolf would look like. And for the goat man, well, we have all heard that take before. I don't think it needs any introduction. Anyways, back to the camping trip. I was going alone this time. I thought about bringing my son along, as he had just recently turned 13, and I felt more comfortable taking him on longer, harsher trips with minimal gear. He always seemed to enjoy camping, but this was out of his league. It was too cold, and the trail was too harsh and unforgiving for anyone without proper experience. The trip itself was over the course of two days. The first was hiking up to the site, which was set up on the highest point of the park. The next day, of course, was a slow hike back, which in all honesty, would have been even more dangerous, due to the rapid drop in elevation, combined with the cold, slick mud and clay that had been found on the trail. I always made sure to pack lightly on hiking trips like this to really push myself when it came to my survival skills. On this trip, I carried with me a small knife, two 50-foot cord strands of 550 paracord, my tent and sleeping bag, and some iodine tablets to purify the water of any harmful bacteria found in the water, a small flashlight, really only strong enough to illuminate 10 to 15 feet in front of me, and then of course a fire starter and duct tape. Overall, I packed more than I normally would for such a trip. However, with the recent birth of my second child a few months ago, I started to take less risks and packed more each time. For food, I brought with me a pack of beef jerky and some granola bars. That's really all I needed to feed my slim frame of 150 pounds at 5'11". Time came for me to leave for my trip. Getting into my truck, I felt a cold feeling wash over me, like a sixth sense telling me not to go on this trip, but I ignored it. I had already taken off work the two days I would be gone, and I'm not about to waste the few precious vacation days I got each year. The drive itself should only take about three hours, depending on the ferry still used by the park. The ferry was the quickest and easiest way to get across to the north side of the park without adding an extra two to three hours onto the drive. It was a common complaint to those who came on vacation from out of state. However, us locals usually took the chance to catch up on a new book, or to double-check our gear in case we had forgotten to pack something while we were on the ferry to reach the south side boarding dock. I was currently reading A Game of Thrones, for the third time. P.S. Danny is like 14, you pervs. I took the ferry only 45 minutes to get back to the south side, 
but when the crew stepped off, they went to each of our vehicles to tell us due to the increase in wind, and with the currents being strong today, there would be no more rides across the water today. Anyone wanting to get across would have to go around and take the bridge across, the closest one being an hour and a half drive away from the docks. This at the time had upset me, however I understood why they couldn't risk the journey across to the other dock, and so I went on my way. It was a fairly long and boring drive. There was no use bringing my cell phone due to there being no signal anywhere in the park. Even on the tallest peak of the park, you would never get a signal. Yes, I know what people are going to say. You should still bring your cell phone when you go out camping. And to that, I agree, but I hated the distraction of it. It always pulled my attention from nature, and also I just didn't want to deal with another piece of equipment I would need to keep track of. Remember, in my mind, the lighter, the better. Originally, I had planned to get to the parking lot at the beginning of the trail by 9 a.m. However, it was now noon and I only had about a good seven hours of daylight left. This meant I wouldn't be able to make it to the camping grounds at the end of the trail by nightfall. This isn't the first time this had happened to me, however. I always hated it when it did. Hiking up the steep incline, even in perfect conditions at night, was dangerous and heavily advised against by park rangers so I would have to make do and set up camp at the first area I could find after sunset started and wake up early tomorrow to catch up on the three hours I had lost due to the ferry. The first three hours of the hike went perfect. I saw a timber rattlesnake. If you ever visit the eastern United States, watch out for those. Not only are they big and strong for a snake, they are also very, and I mean very, venomous. Once I had hit the five hour mark on my hike, I had run out of water for the second time and needed to refill my bottle since it was the last chance you get until you make your way back down. I was going to go for about another 30 minutes or so before I made camp. There was a nice clearing up ahead that if I could get to it, then I would be in good shape to make up the lost time tomorrow. While refilling my water, I noticed paw prints in the mud about seven feet off to my left on the bank. It was undoubtedly a canine print left from where I presumed was a coyote coming to stop by for some water within the last 24 hours. That was until I got closer to the print and realized just how massive it was. Now, I'm a smoker. I smoke around a pack a day and, well, this print was about two packs long and slightly bigger than one pack wide. Let me translate that for all the non-smoking listeners. Whatever made this print was massive. There's no way a coyote made this print. There aren't any wolves in Kentucky. There's also no dog breeds I know about that make prints that big. Whatever made this was massive. And well, I had no intentions on staying here by the river and wait for its return. I hurried back on the trail this time with more pep in my step so that I could hurry and set up camp to offer some protection if whatever that thing that had made that print was still around. I made it to the clearing and set up camp just as the sunset was starting to fade into dusk. First, I quickly set up my tent and threw my sleeping bag inside, followed by starting a fire. If there was a predator out there in the woods, the fire would keep them at a distance for a while at least, so I thought. I next used my two strands of 550 paracord and tied them around the campsite at knee level to act as a tripwire for anyone or anything coming onto the campsite to give myself a few more precious seconds of time to react. I finally sat down and tore into the pack of jerky I had packed. This gave me some comfort and relaxation as now I had food in my stomach and a fire to keep me warm. Then I heard it snap. My blood went cold as my mind went a million miles an hour as to what could have made that noise. Was it a person? Could it be just some sort of animal like a deer just passing through? What if it was that creature that made that print back down by the river? Whatever it was, it was large and heavy as I heard twigs snapping louder and louder as it drew closer. Who's out there? Announce yourself! No answer came. 
I have a gun and I'll shoot you if you don't announce yourself. It was a lie. However, it was a bluff that had gotten a response countless times over the years, however. Still, no answer came. Whatever was making these noises was heavy. It had to have been several hundred pounds for it to make twigs snap that loud. Like they were bones being broken with each step and every step. That's also when I noticed just how much distance the creature had covered in only a few seconds. Whatever it was, it couldn't be human. Its pace was too slow for the amount of ground covered, and the steps were too loud and powerful for it to be a person. Some time passed, and before I heard anything else, the steps had stopped just outside of the light my fire produced. Whatever this thing was, it was smart, and understood to stay out of the light where it could see me and I couldn't see it. And there we stayed for what felt like an eternity, unmoving, trying desperately to stretch the little bit of wood I gathered to keep the fire going as long as possible. It was waiting for the fire to die out, but I wouldn't let it. I couldn't let this thing get a chance to attack me in the dark. I knew if it really wanted me, all it had to do was come right into the camp and have me for dinner, but it never came. Some time passed, and the fire had come to its small desperate final breaths of life when I decided to head into my tent, thinking the creature had moved on to choose another target. That's when I saw it. Those awful amber eyes, cold without emotion. They struck utter fear into me. This creature was massive. It had to have been at least eight, nine feet tall. I couldn't see the full body. It was too dark for that. But those eyes... Those cold, terrible eyes will haunt me for the rest of my days. I still see them to this day, every night laying awake and in my sleep. I quickly turned my flashlight on and saw the large, lanky frame of the beast. Its dark black fur covered up what was undoubtedly an impressive and horrifying amount of muscle for its build. That's when I realized the putrid stench that had come with it. In my fear, I had not noticed the foul smell of death and rot that followed this creature. It only took the smallest moment to react and drop down to all fours and let out the lowest, most awful growl I had ever heard. It could be felt in my soul, the anger and hatred this thing possessed could only be described as pure evil incarnate. I quickly hurried into my tent and hid from the gruesome end that was about to come my way, praying not to any specific deity but anyone or anything out there who would hear me. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Please, God, save me. I don't want to die. I heard the creature approach right up to the tent, sniffing and growling at me. I swear, I don't think my heart had beat a single time. What felt like hours had passed without a sound. Then it was gone. Its howls could be heard off into the distance reminding me that I was lucky to not end up as its supper tonight. I did not sleep for even a second that night. How could I? I had just experienced the face of pure evil, malice itself given form into our world. I knew I should not be alive, and that the only reason I did not die that night was by its choice and that alone. When dawn broke, I exited my tent and found evidence of the creature all over the campsite. Pieces of fur, paw prints, and claw marks on nearby trees, just to name a few. This trend continued on the trail back to the car. I never made it to the end of the trail. As soon as I packed up camp, I hightailed it out of those woods. I knew if I was to encounter that creature again, I would not be so lucky next time. When I got to the car, I threw my backpack into the back seat and hurried into the front seat of the car, not saying a word. I sat there in silence with my face in my palms. When I looked up, I saw its amber eyes staring at me, 
looking at me with a pleased expression on its face of terror and trauma that it had just caused me. This thing, it was intelligent. It wasn't after me to kill or for sport. It was after me to make me suffer. Like human suffering was its way of feeding. The look of pleasure on its face. That grin with its long, terrible yellow teeth showing. God, why is such a creature allowed to exist in this world? What grave sin have I committed to be tortured by this thing's existence? I started the car's engine and drove off, driving well over the speed limit. Every now and then at a stop sign, I swear I would see those amber eyes, but each time I looked again, they were gone. When I got to the north side of the park's docks, I waited there patiently as the ferry slowly made its way back. When the crew finally came up to my car, they stopped and remarked how pale I looked, like I had just seen a ghost. I knew they wouldn't believe my story, so I brushed it off as the cold weather taking its toll. I rode home in silence, the radio was turned off, and I was left in my thoughts racing through my mind about the creature. When I arrived home late that night, my wife had already put our daughter to sleep. My son was off at some friend's house playing Halo 3, having a good time. I sat there on the couch, contemplating what had just happened out there on that trip. I decided to head to bed soon after. When I opened the door, my wife Sarah had remarked that I stunk, and if I had been sprayed by a skunk, my blood ran cold. I smelt it now, too. That awful, putrid stench. I made sure not to make a face, and dismissed her calmly, and went to take a shower. As I got done, I looked out the window, and there it was illuminated by the streetlight with that insidious grin on its face. It had followed me home and saw the fear on my face. Oh, the joy that must have given it. It's been two months since that camping trip. Every night it returns, sometimes brushing up against the side of the house, other times staring in through the window, and others howling in the distance. It made sure I understood it wasn't going anywhere. I had done some digging up online and found out the creature was a barilla. It had other names as well, like the Dog Man and the Beast of Bray Road. It's been three more months since I found out what this creature was. I've been in contact with God knows how many experts to try and get rid of this thing from my existence. And with each attempt, the Dog Man's pleasure grew as it knew I was desperate to rid myself of it. I cannot keep living my life this way. When you find that I will be gone by the time you hear this, just know I love you and I'm sorry. I will not give this creature the pleasure it seeks so easily. I am sorry. I love you all. And when you read or hear this, please sell the house and move as far away from Mammoth Cave as you can. When it learns I have killed myself, it will come for one of you next. Thanks for listening to these strange and downright disturbing Dogman Horror Stories. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps the swamp grow. It's very much appreciated. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story tonight was your favorite. It lets me know what stories you like better so I can pick better ones in the future. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Many thanks and much love and appreciation to my good friend Zach Baby TV, who read two stories for us tonight. He's a great narrator, and if you enjoy Dogman Encounters and other cryptid stories, be sure to check out his channel. He uploads them every single day, and you'll never be disappointed. 
if you enjoyed these stories and would like to download them and bring them with you no matter where you are, but don't have YouTube Premium, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and just about everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. If you would like to support the show outside of all that, maybe check out our Twitch channel. I stream twice a week over there between 8 to 12 hours a week. I play all kinds of scary games and do live narrations. Also, maybe check out the merch store. We have t-shirts, hoodies, and more. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool swamp threads. Don't forget to join me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.